Okay, so now that we've learned about strategy and the application of strategy to small businesses and large businesses, we want to look at using IT, the internet, and virtual teams and applying these for strategic advantage. So you have to know what competitive advantage is before you can use the tools of IT or the internet to achieve strategic advantage. So the first question, of course, is what is an e-business and what does that have to do with e-entrepreneurship? So the first thing to know is that really the real digital age has just begun. We think that we've made a lot of strides in the last 10, 15 years since the internet and the World Wide Web have become quite popular and it's really expanded into a lot of areas, but it's really just getting started. And it's been predicted that there will be 10 successful startups in wave two for every one successful startup that there was in wave one. And that really the most op entrepreneurial investment opportunities are really still ahead of us. And we've got a lot of things going for us. One is the whole generation of tech savvy, 18 year olds, you know, pretty much anyone from the age of 12 till about 30 really get technology. And like, even my parents in their 80s, like they use Skype, they buy things on Amazon, they use the internet, um, their TV is connected through the internet to the things that they want to use, and they use the internet for a lot more things than I think younger people give them credit for. But in addition to the late adopters like, like my parents and people in their 80s, there's this overwhelming number of tech-savvy younger people as well. There's now more non-PCs than PCs that are attached to the internet. Of course, there's the dramatic use of mobile devices. Uh, the upcoming Google Glass is going to transform everything yet again. Uh, pilotless electric cars are going to transform things yet again. And of course, there's the whole issue of convergence. Uh, basically, uh, that entertainment content, uh, set-top boxes, game consoles, PCs, and broadband and wireless are all coming together into a in-home entertainment user experience. And all of these opportunities and trends are going to drive the adoption of e-business in general. The other thing to know is that businesses still have to spend a lot of money on the next generation technology. That for the last ooh, five years, um, tech spending has really gone down. Uh, people's uh, desktop computers are starting to get old. Their intranets are starting to get old. A lot of the technology that they implemented five, ten years ago is really starting to show its age. And so there's going to be a lot more money coming out, uh, coming up pretty soon in that. We also see the emergence of world citizens, sometimes called netizens. These are increasingly empowered and independent people. We've seen the rise of organizations like Anonymous, for example. We've seen the power of people in Syria who can, uh, um, or not just Syria, but in the, uh, the Arab Spring in general, the, the power of independent citizens to rise up against their governments, to have uh, flash demonstrations, to evade government's uh, scrutiny and security, and to push towards a freer, more democratic society. People don't have to affiliate anymore with the person who happens to be on the street next to them. They don't have to affiliate necessarily with people of the same class and color and religion. They can affiliate with people that they have interests with. And so you don't just have to talk to people that you know on your street, but you can talk to people on the other side of the planet that share your interest in butterflies or birds or social democracy or uh, women's empowerment or gay and lesbian rights or whatever the interest that you have. You can find other people that have that interest as well. We're also finding that the creators and distributors of information are starting to become as powerful, if not more powerful, than governments. And it's becoming increasingly easy to evade the government's restriction on privacy and, uh, again, you know, the rise of the Arab Spring and the ability of their citizenry to use uh, Twitter and the power of the Internet to um, basically push their social agenda in, in uh, conflict with the agenda of the, uh, the dictators in charge at the time. Basically, entrepreneurial capitalism is spreading worldwide. And as well, it's really not 
you know, wave one really came out of North America. Um, Europe had a, a big role as well, too, in, in wave one. I think a lot of the big new, especially social media um, innovations are starting to come out of, out of Southeast Asia. And uh, some of the gaming uh, uh, things that we're seeing and some of the social media that we're seeing coming out of places like South Korea, China, and, um, and Japan are really incredible. And, and we're going to start seeing more and more trends and opportunities coming from other parts of the world rather than from what we tend to think of as the dominant power, uh, North America and Europe. So what's this got to do with e-business? Well, there's a lot of different ways to define e-business. Is it buying and selling stuff on the internet or is that just e-commerce? Is it collaborating with partners, uh, finding ways through electronic data exchange to collaborate and integrate supply channels, something that the automotive companies have been doing forever? Is it about managing customer relationships, uh, basically empowering your customers to be able to manage their own customer accounts? Is it about optimizing internal operations? Is it about empowering your employees through collaboration and use of the intranet? Or is it deploying applications um, on the internet, such, like, uh, such as application service providers? What exactly is e-business? Well, one question to ask might be, what isn't e-business? So think about that for a second. Name a business that doesn't use the internet or the power of information technology to somehow manage itself. Maybe your local bratwurst vendor at the uh, corn market on Saturday. Maybe the ice cream truck. You know, even a haircutting salon uses some kind of an IT system to balance its book, to manage its accounting, to file its taxes, to interact with the government, to communicate with its employees. It's kind of hard to evade the presence of information technology in the internet. There's very few businesses that aren't e-businesses or that use business e-something e, e in their business. I think IBM did a pretty good job defining e-business, and uh, you know they, they use a lot of fancy words here, but basically it's an approach to delivering better business value by combining back-end systems and processes with the reach made possible by the internet. So I put that here as it's connecting back office IT systems to the front office internet. So really maximizing operations, through IT systems, as well as expanding your reach through the internet. And so you can expand the power of these systems and the reach of the internet to suppliers, customers, employees, affiliation groups, and increasingly to connected devices, things like motors, things like industrial drives, things like lights, radiator systems, chemical processes, doors, uh, gates and switches not just using the internet to communicate with people, but also using the internet to connect with other things, like your car, for example. So before we go any further, I thought it would be important to remind you that the web is not the internet. The World Wide Web is not the same thing as the internet. The internet refers to a network infrastructure and, and specific standards. In particular, uh, the big standard is the TCP IP internet protocol. This is what enables packets of information to go from me in Toronto to you in Germany through a multiply redundant system. So, for example, um, if I'm calling you with a telephone call, there's basically an analog connection that goes from my sound of my voice uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, a continuous waveform that goes from me to you. And if that connection is broken, then the phone call doesn't work. Whereas the internet protocol, basically my waveform of my voice gets broken up into little packets 
and one packet might go through France, the next packet might go through England, the next packet might go through Japan, the next packet might go through China, well, probably not China, the next packet might go through Australia, and eventually they recombine at your computer in Germany and reassemble themselves back into the right order. And this is the beauty of the internet that we have this multiply redundant system that enables information to go any way it wants to get to the intended destination and then reassemble in the right order. So um, there's a variety of standards. There's the HTML standard and we've gone from HTML 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. Uh, HTML5 uh, promises to basically make uh, apps redundant, uh, so that should be a big new transformation. Uh, and of course, you know, um, uh, Google wants its own version of HTML4 versus Microsoft wants its own version of HTML4, and Chrome is optimized as a browser for its version of HTML, and Microsoft has its own little special stuff that its version of HTML is better, and there's other standards like VRHML was a, was a big standard that was out for a while. Email has a series of its own standards, uh, online chat. And of course, other people like uh, Flash and QuickTime have their own standards as well, too. The World Wide Web, on the other hand, is basically the use of a browser. Uh, and it's only one of many services available on the internet, whether it's for the internet, uh, extranet, or, or the internet. So that's just kind of a quick little background on that. So the back office IT systems can be used to create strategic competitive advantage in a variety of ways. The most obvious way is to run your business more efficiently, that you can streamline or re-engineer business processes. So for example, at one time, if a customer ordered something, maybe they had to write something down on a piece of paper, they then had to fax it. The fax showed up uh, on some secretary's desk. He would then uh, get a copy of this fax, make four copies of it. One would go into a filing cabinet. Uh, another copy would go to the um, inventory person. Another person would go to the work in progress person. Another one would go to the salesperson so the salesperson knew that uh, a sale had just been made. And, uh, um, you know, this was a complicated series of processes that different people would have to communicate with each other, whereas using IT systems, one order can come in and automatically go to all the various people that need to know about this. And you can use this information to streamline systems and streamline uh, ordering of new inventory. There's all kinds of things you can do with the IT systems to, to re-engineer and streamline your business processes. Um, you can reduce cost increase productivity, um, but also improve the scalability of your system so that um, once you've proven your business works for, let's say, 100 customers using a good IT system, if you can sell to 100 people, you can potentially sell to 100 million people because you have good, solid, robust processes that are run through a good IT system. You can also use IT to provide better insight into your business. So this is called data mining or big data is the big new thing these days. And this is the ability to use information to better understand your business, to use information to understand that this marketing campaign was more effective than that marketing campaign, or to understand that when um, BBC talks about your business, what's the impact on your share price, what's the impact on the number of hits to your website, when people come to your website, do they stay for a long time? Um, and you can do all kinds of experiments. You can change the color of the buttons on your website and be able to determine, for example, ah, actually if we put red buttons instead of blue buttons on the website, we increase our sell rate from 0.35 to 0.45 percent or something like this. That's a trivial example, but there's a lot of things you can do to make your website more search engine optimized and, and to be able to use Google Analytics or other data mining tools to be able to understand how to run your business. You can use IT to develop new products and services. You can gather business about your customers and competitors and improve your customer relationship. You can let your customers get more involved in the design and the servicing of their own um, experience that they have with your company. The front office internet 
can be used for competitive advantage as well. The most obvious example is to expand your market reach. Rather than only being able to communicate with the people you can pick up and meet, uh, you know, on, you know, pick up a phone and talk to, or you can meet face to face with, or you can fly to, or see at a trade show, you can expand your reach dramatically to anybody that can see your website, or anybody that comes to your YouTube channel, or anybody that sees your Twitter or anything like that. It increases your visibility in the marketplace, increases your presence. You can use it to improve customer service, increase your responsiveness to customers, develop new services, strengthen relationships, reduce channel conflicts. There's a lot of things you can use the internet for, for competitive advantage as well too. Some of the specific properties of the internet that you should consider, and these are kind of taking a step back and looking at some of the more fundamental things that the, that the internet enables you to do. One is it's, an, it's a mediating technology that it basically allows you to interconnect with people in a different way. That rather than only seeing people face to face, you can, you can communicate with them through this channel. Um, it's, it's a certain universality as well too. It can either enlarge or shrink the world. It enlarges the world because you can reach anyone, anytime, night or day. And so the number of people you can communicate with expands dramatically. But it shrinks the world as well too. It makes the world a smaller place. That, for example, an employee in California doesn't have to relocate to a job in Canada to do their job anymore. That you can use virtual teams, uh, you can um, communicate with people without having to fly there. And so it makes the world a smaller place, easier to communicate with other people. There's the concept of network externalities. This is specifically referred to as Metcalfe's Law, that the value of a network increases as the square of the number of people in the network. So for example, um, Facebook. If I was the only person with Facebook, I wouldn't have very many friends, and it wouldn't be a very good network. But um, if everybody I know is on Facebook, then Facebook becomes a much more powerful tool. And so if only half of my friends are on Facebook, it's not so good. Um, an example would be uh, Google Circles, for example. So everybody I know is on Facebook. Most people I know are on Facebook. And so Facebook works just fine. Why would I switch to Google Circles when a lot of the people I know aren't on Google Circle yet? And so the value of a network increases dramatically as the number of people in that network increases. And this is true of all the social media ones. You know, why would anybody care about Twitter if I tweeted and, or I tweeted and nobody was bothering to listen? Of course, it's important as a distribution channel. Um, you know, a lot of people only find out about information about their new software or music via uh, online distribution channels. You know, the ability to download something from iTunes, for example, or the ability to look at Amazon to be able to find a new book or something like that. It's also a time moderator. It can shrink or enlarge time frames. Um, one of the things I loved about my last company was it really shrunk time frames because we would drop a gold code um, every evening before the end of work. And uh, our, our uh, employees in Japan would wake up in the morning, hey, there'd be a new version of the product for them to bug test. They'd work all day long telling us about what all our problems were. We'd sleep happily or go out and have a beer or something like that. We'd get up in the morning and there was all the problems from, the, from our code from the night before. So that really shrunk time a lot. But normally you have to build a product Go home, get a good night's sleep, get up the next day, test the product, figure out what needs to be fixed, go home, go to sleep, get up the next day, rebuild the product and fix all the problems. This was great. We loved the fact that while we were sleeping, employees on the other side of the world were busy figuring out what the problem was. So it really, um, really shrunk our, the, the time frame that it required. Uh, we were starting to release a new version of the product conceivably every 24 hours, that uh, we'd usually go a little bit further than that between um, uh, al uh, alpha releases or, or you know, gold code releases. But uh, we could release a new ver the version of the product literally every day or two. Um, information asymmetry is shrunk as well too. So this is a big issue with negotiation. 
So, you know, back in the day, I had no idea what a fair price for a car would be. And if you go to talk to your car dealer, they knew everything about the sales price of the car. And they, that's all they did for a living. I'd show up at a car dealership and I'd just be fresh meat for them to abuse and take advantage of and tell me whatever the heck they wanted. And I didn't know any better. If they said this was a fair price and this is how much they were making, I didn't know. I kind of had to believe them. Now, before I show up at a car dealership, I know everything that they know. I know how much the car costs, how much other people are paying, what the dealer rate is, what the best price could be. I know what other people are paying for. I know which dealership to go to. I know what the, what the um, uh, maintenance record on the car is. I know basically everything I need to know about that car. And I can walk in and say, this is how much I'm willing to pay. And I know that you're going to take my deal because you've taken the same deal with somebody else last week. So it's a very powerful uh, way to reduce information asymmetries. Combining the internet and these IT things enables you to do a number of other important things as well too, uh, such as located on this thing. It lets you really uh, improve transactional capability, reduce geographical problems, let you automate things, gives you more analytical information, lets you do knowledge management, tracking of things, disintermediating things. It's, 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 it's an incredibly powerful way to create sustainable competitive advantage in a wide variety of different ways. Some examples of e-businesses, you know, this is just me going through the alphabet, right? A through Z, here we go. You know, there's e-auctioning and banking and commerce and directories and franchising and gambling and gaming. You can read this as fast as I can say them. But there's also business to business, business to consumer, business to employee, government to consumer, and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So um, it's a big, wide, exciting world out there. Um, you don't need me to hold your hand and tell you everything that you think you need to know about this stuff. Everything you need to know about any of these things, you can access through Google. You know, you want to become an expert at how to create something in the e-fulfillment category. You want to get some deep personal competencies related to any of these areas. Pick something you're interested in. Figure it out for yourself. The world is your oyster. You know, uh, find a new pearl every day in this oyster. So again, the purpose of this class is to open your eyes to the possibilities out there. It is not my job to spoon feed you everything you need to know about what IT is, uh, what the internet is for. You've been using the internet for many years. You don't need me to spoon feed you how to use the internet or what the internet is good for. You don't need me to spoon feed you what IT is about and what the different systems are. You can figure this stuff for, out for yourself. And my job is to inspire and point you in the right direction and give you feedback on how to use these things and to give you feedback on whether you're appropriately applying these technologies to creating sustainable competitive advantages within your business. So um, you have to learn how to learn. And you know the days when other people taught you how to do things, really at this time in your life, you need to, you need to get past. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I taught an introductory um, information technology management course. This is for first year undergraduate students at Ryerson University. And I had to teach my students how to program in HTML. Why? Because it was on the course syllabus. It was one of the things uh, other, other professors in the program said my students have to know how to program in HTML. Steve, you need to make sure you teach them how to program HTML. Guess how I did it? I said, here's the assignment. Go to Google. Type in how to program in HTML. Click on a couple of links. Read how to program in HTML. There's an assignment due next week where I expect you to deliver a website. You give me a TXT text file, and we're going to run it through a browser and make sure that your website works. So, um, you know, to expect a professor to spoon feed you how to program in HTML is absurd you have the ability to learn all this stuff on your own. And a lot of the content that any course would potentially give you is already available out there. 
I can help assemble some of the major concepts together, and I can help coach and provide mentorship and inspiration on how to apply these things. But um, the details of what all of these things are really is inappropriate for a graduate level course. So moving on. Some of the challenges of e-business. You know, if I made this sound really easy, I'm sorry, I apologize. It's never as easy as it seems. It's always easier when you're talking about things in the abstract. It's always more difficult when you're applying it to a real world situation. Going global is not as easy as it seems. There's different languages, um, and that's hard. Figuring out how to do things in different languages is, is certainly a challenge. Um, accepting money in different currencies is difficult. Um, different local interests, different local regulations and things like that is all very difficult. Most big companies have, company, have country-specific websites. So the ability to make just one website that does it all for everybody is more difficult than it seems. And um, at a certain point in time, yeah, you can add, you know, maybe in addition to your German language uh, website, you add an English one and then a French one and then maybe a Chinese one. Uh, at a certain point in time, you may have to have country-specific websites. Um, you know... A lot of my students have this business model. Well, first of all, I'm going to give it away for free. And because it's free, everyone's going to download my free thing. And once I have 100 million people with my wonderful free thing, I'm going to start making money off of it. But the problem is, it's harder to give away something for free than you might imagine. So here's an exercise for you. Go to download.com and uh, go to any type of software that's available free, and I don't care what it is. It could be some kind of, you know, Kazaa or Morpheus or LimeWire or peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, or it could be uh, a tax software or something like that. And look at all the companies giving away free stuff and check out their numbers. They're not as high as you might think. There are tens of thousands of companies that have a free product out there available that are doing 50 downloads a week, 200 downloads a week, 400 downloads a week. And I can promise you most of these people probably thought they'd have millions of downloads and they totally failed to hit their numbers. Just because it's free, just because it's available, doesn't mean people will find you care about you, download your crazy thing onto their system, figure out why it works, do your beta testing for you, write back to you telling you what doesn't work, uh, and then go back and get the new version because you're so cool and you're free. It's harder to give away free stuff than you might think. Yes, can you tell I've done this before? <laughs> uh, competition's just a click away. You know, your website takes 10 seconds to load, <laughs> gone. Uh, your website is confusing, gone. Uh, you know, I don't understand what your thing does or it uses a language, gone. Um, potential for channel conflicts, right? Just because uh, you've got one person using your product here and maybe a distributor pushing your product there, people find out about this stuff. So you have to avoid channel conflicts. Copyright infringement, people steal your stuff. You've heard this before. Uh, security and privacy concerns, this is becoming increasingly important. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can't talk enough about that. And uh, I think I'll leave you with uh, a very interesting thing that um, uh, Don Tapscott uh, talked about, or Tapscott and Tiskell talk about in their book, The Naked Corporation. That, you know, in the age of transparency, everybody knows everything they want to know about you. You know, just because you're, you know, the princess of Cornwall, you can't go and take your top off and not expect that some French photographer is going to take your picture. You're out in public with your top off, somebody's going to take a picture. There's just no getting around that. If you're embezzling money, people will find out. If you're lying to your customers, they'll find out. If your product doesn't do what it says, people will find out. If you have bugs and problems, People will find out, and when they find out, they will complain loudly, very loudly. Even if you didn't do anything wrong, they'll complain loudly. you got to get over it. In the age of transparency, everybody is naked. And as Don Tapscott says, if you have to be naked, you better be buff. 
meaning that if you're going to be naked, people have to like what they see. So, as an entrepreneur, you have to find a way to infuse your personal character, your personal sense of integrity into the company culture that you create. And so the, the necessity for companies to have integrity and to make sure that everything they say and do online is true and, and, and works in the real world, um, this is an important future that we're living in, that everyone will know everything and so you have to have character and integrity. Thanks.